this story, I don't know that it's really important to the story, but almost every telling I found of it made sure specifically to mention the word <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> What's an <laughs> Means that they're like one-eighth black. Oh. Okay. It's kind of a problematic word these days, so I don't know that I need to use it, but I found it odd that I almost... Mean... Almost every it, telling of the story included it. <laughs> it seems um, offensive. Yeah, okay, well, that's so kind of what I thought. When you look at it on dictionary.com, they give you a little disclaimer, dated, offensive under it. Well, and that's kind of what I figured. But like I said, almost every version I found made sure to throw that word in there, like, just because they could. Like, it has no bearing on the story that I can see. I mean... I didn't know we needed to get that specific if we were talking about someone of mixed race in the South, but no, I, now we know. I think you and I probably don't need to be that specific. <laughs> Welcome to the Booze and Spirits Podcast. It's like a drink with death. I'm your host, Nick McDonald. This is my other host. Hi, I'm Kate McDonald. Who'll chime in when she is forced to. <laughs> uh, I'm this like is, a big child at the time. This is our, our first podcast, and you will quickly notice by the lack of professionalism and organization that we are not especially experienced in this behavior, but we're enthusiastic, so what more can you ask for? Um, the idea behind the Booze and Spirits podcast is that Kate and I are both big fans of ghost stories, and we're fairly big fans of drinking, too. So, we decided, why not combine the two? So, I'm here <laughs> with my drinking knowledge. I bring to, well, okay, I actually have many years bartending experience that we had on top of this, um, and have worked in restaurants. And create a drink menu. So I'm here to give you guys the nicest drink recipes you can pair with a ghost story this side of the Mississippi. So a little bit about us. Um, like I said, I'm Nick McDonald. My passion here is mostly I'm real big into storytelling. And I love ghost stories. I have since I was a little kid. I, I basically learned how to read by checking out ghost books from the library as a little kid. And reading them and rereading them. And remembering the stories and collecting them. And uh, my sister, Kate, shares the same passion. Go for Kate. <laughs> we can chop it out. We can chop it out. Uh, this is true. Uh, Nick and I grew up in what we found out when we moved to town from stories we heard from other kids was a very haunted house. So I think that probably sparked a little bit of interest for me. Um you know, it's just been something we've been exposed to our entire lives and enthralled with. So we love us some ghost stories, some haunted locations, and some good cocktails. So part of what this is, is we have decided to challenge my bartending skills, my drink writing skills. I don't use that M word that ends with ologist. Um, but challenge those skills to come up with a cocktail that is kind of inspired by one or more of the stories we tell for that episode. So we'll present some ghost stories. We'll present some drink recipes that you've uh, never seen before. And it's bound to be a whole lot of fun. So let's get and, into it. And nonsense. Fun and nonsense. Whoop, whoop. Okay, my story is of the French Quarter rooftop woman, which I guess is kind of a famous one because I was able to find a lot of information on this story. Um, the ghost appears as a naked woman on the roof of a building in the French Quarter of New Orleans. But wait, like, stop right there. Are we sure this is a ghost? Because I have spent some time <laughs> in the French Quarter. <laughs> so this is the story of a woman who's, in most of the stories, they call Julie. And a well-off businessman who's often called Zachary. And, well, we'll just stick with those names because I have nothing better to use. Julie was madly in love with this businessman, but either he didn't love her back or he was afraid of a scandal. There's kind of two versions of the story. One is that Julie was a slave and the businessman was her owner. And the other was that Julie was just a well-to-do lady of mixed blood. Um, 
kind of the common theme either way, though, is that he didn't really love her back. He just kind of kept her around as a convenience. Also sounds like New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll go. Go on with the story. Anyway, my, my, my theory is that she is more likely a local lady of status. But like I say, the story has a lot of variations. It's a fairly popular one. The, the And also, I kind of like the idea that she was a lady of status, because it adds the detail that when they met, they would always meet on the third floor of his house for their get-togethers, because he would keep his friends in general society relegated to the lower two floors when he was entertaining, and he would keep her up on the third floor and just kind of bounce between the two locations where he was being the public man of leisure and hopping upstairs to go visit her for a while. Uh, that was the, very PG. <laughs> the house actually has an address, which, you know, you don't always get with a ghost story. Uh, it's uh, 734 Royal Street. Today, I believe it's an art gallery. You know, if anyone goes spook hunting, you know, standard rules apply. Don't disturb the owners. Get permission. This one, apparently the ghost appears on the roof, so you shouldn't really need to go in and bug people, I would presume. It- Looks like it's condos now. Oh, is it? Okay. The last last I mean, thing I saw. Be, there may be an art studio like that part of town. There's a lot of businesses on the first floor and residents above. Yeah. Well, and that could very well be. I just know that all I could see was uh, an art gallery when I checked it all on Google Street View. But, you know, that changes all the time. So Anyway, so they have this wonderful living arrangement, I guess. Well, sort of living arrangement where... Zachary has his fun on floors one and two, and he keeps Julie hidden away on the third floor. Whatever the buildup happened to be, the story goes that one December, Julie decided to lay down an ultimatum and demanded that Zachary married her. Of course, like I said, he didn't really love her, so he tried to skirt the subject, and he thought that he could get her to drop the whole thing by telling her that if she stripped down naked, climbed out on the roof, and stayed there all night, then he would marry her. And Do we know what time of year this was? This was December. Supposedly. He's a charming man. He, I mean, yeah, you can see why she would be all over this guy. Anyway, he thought she wouldn't ever go for it and decided to go downstairs and play chess with a friend. Julie, determined not to let it go, decided to strip buck naked, climb on the slanted roof, and spent the night out there and died. Like we said, it was December. Um, I did do some investigating here in New Orleans. The average December temperature is 46, which is enough for hypothermia. And supposedly there was a storm that night, rain and wind, so that would indeed exacerbate the matter. Yeah. Next winter, the ghost was the first time the ghost appeared. Um, Now, supposedly people report a slender, naked, golden-skinned woman wearing only hoop earrings, huddled up, pacing the roof, trying to build body heat. Oftentimes, people even report seeing her collapse up there. So she might be a residual haunting. Or is she showing some sort of intelligence? Oh, I don't know. It sounds like it's it's more of a residual thing. She kind of just goes through the motions. You know, sometimes they also see, like, a ghostly chessboard in the third story. Uh, you know, sometimes being played by a man or two. And there's also been reports of people seeing Zachary through the windows in the garden below. Um, which, like, I mean, you saw. it sounds like you checked it out on Google Street. You must be on the back side because there's, like, no room for a garden on the front. I just Googled it and saw some real estate, old real estate information, but yeah. Anyway, so that's the, the story of the the French Quarter rooftop woman. It's, like I say, it's fairly common, so I guess a lot of people have seen her. There's even a, a legend that if you leave her notes written on yellow paper with blue ink and uh, write your love problems on them and leave them next to the house, she'll solve them for you. That was um that's very specific. <laughs> I don't, well, I don't know. Like they said, like there's, there's. She has an affinity for legal pads. <laughs> there's some mention of her golden skin and a, lo- a couple of the stories. And, and then she know, turns blue. And she turns blue. So maybe there's some symbolism in that. I'm not entirely sure. Well, I mean, my little OCD self, I prefer blue pens because that way I can tell an original from a copy very quickly. Ah. But I ah. feel like that's probably not the logic there. You know, I'm. You know, guessing there's probably something in voodoo or some other local legend that that all sparked from with yellow paper and blue ink. But 
I might, maybe, I might. maybe it's just a so leap. Maybe, hey, maybe Zachary was a lawyer. I couldn't really find what exactly it was that he did. So maybe that's the whole gimmick there. So it's the legal pad. We're it, back it, on the, the legal pad. We're back on legal pads. That's right. It's the only way that she'll pay attention is if you get a proper note and uh, get it stamped by your notary. <laughs> so that's what I got. What do you have that I believe is another rooftop woman? I do have another rooftop woman. So, I believe you can go stay in this location. My, I'm going to take us to Arizona, to Phoenix, to the Hotel San Carlos, which I found this ghost story, which seems to be pretty common, before I discovered that the Hotel San Carlos has another claim to fame. It is seen in the opening of uh, Psycho. Just the opening? Well, the the very beginning. It's not the. It's not like the well, motel. No, it's, it's not the Gates no. Motel, but. No, it's like in the when in the beginning when she's downtown. Got. It. Which I have not watched Psycho in at least fifteen years, so this is yeah, same here. a very blurry <laughs> recollection to me. But I feel like she runs out of a building into a car or something, and Hotel San Carlos is somewhere there. But it is currently. Phoenix's only historic boutique hotel and has been in continuous operation since 1928. Uh, 128 guest rooms. I believe it's seven floors, seven stories oh, high. This is, oh, this is a pretty big place, though, because I was thinking. This is a pretty big place. And it when was. When you said boutique, um, I was thinking, you know. Okay, I'll admit it. I was thinking little Adobe House. That's what I was thinking. You said Arizona. I immediately went to Adobe House. That's how stereotypical my brain works. They, um,. They even have indoor plumbing in Arizona now. Pshaw, yeah. you say. Pshaw. That's what people think about where I live. Anyway, um, <laughs> Mae West reported to have stayed here in 1929. I just apparently accidentally opened up hotel history about this place, and I'm enjoying it. But they had <laughs> lots of big names there. Um, it had a French cafe in the rest or restaurants in the bottom floor um but it was supposed to be the first luxury hotel in phoenix and the first one with air conditioning so that's exciting now was that in 1928 or did they have to install it yeah i believe so i believe it was built with air conditioning so i'm assuming not the world's most efficient air conditioning but probably way better than the place next door (laughs) so um most of the stories I can find on this hotel seem to cite our heroine by name. Her name is Leona Jensen. And then she came to Phoenix to meet with her love, um, which we believe to be a bellboy from a different nearby hotel. Uh-huh. So, Oh, and this hotel is supposed to have some other ghost activity that is unrelated. There's, like, children that you hear running up and down the halls, apparently. And from what I found, it looks like this hotel was built on the site of the original school in the Phoenix area. So there was a schoolhouse there in the 1800s. And then at some point in time, the hotel, like, it was torn down and the hotel was built. Okay, but... I gotta, I gotta jump in here. This is sounds like it's supposed to be a fairly fancy place, right? I believe so. So, is Leona well to do, or is this other busboy just making bank that they're hanging out at the fanciest hotel in town? Bellboy, not a busboy. <laughs> Sorry, bellboy. Bellhop, hippity hop. Um, you know, I did not find the because they details. make because because the the wage difference between bellhop and busboy is such. A vast right. scope. Um, I didn't see anything citing her being well to do, but maybe maybe she had a bell boyfriend there too and you got her a deal. I don't know. <laughs> Leona. Good God girl. Let's see. Well, yeah, she had traveled from across the country is the story to meet her her fiance or boyfriend. So I don't know. She must have had some money. Or saved right. up for this trip. All right, I'll quit poking holes. <laughs> I'll quit poking holes. Logistics are not important. The story is important. <laughs> Stop making me think too. <laughs> I was gonna say too early in the day, but I've been up for hours. Um. Anyway, so she comes to town 
to see her love and never checks out of her room. They believe that she threw herself out of the penthouse dressed in an evening gown like she was getting ready to go dancing with him. So from kind of, and that's kind of the, I found multiple places to talk about this story and that seems kind of to be the thing is that Leona was probably dressed up to go see him. They were going to go out for the night and he broke her heart. She got there and he didn't love her anymore. So she she was not staying in the penthouse, it doesn't appear, but she made her way up to the seventh floor and flung herself out of the window in her evening gown. So she was very distraught. Right. Because if she's just doing this for revenge, she'd have gone to his place of business and, you know, wrote some obscene things on the wall and then killed herself, like, in right. his locker, in his work locker. Yes. Because bellboys have lockers. Yes. They're at whole women, from my research. Uh, there is a rooftop pool as well. So there has been seen um, a woman wandering. She wanders the halls and the rooftop. I have not seen, uh, she doesn't go swimming, it doesn't appear. She's not dressed for swimming. Well, it's true. I mean, she wasn't dressed for base jumping either, but here we are. You know what? If I ever am so upset that I decide to fling myself off a roof, I'm doing it in my nicest dress. I'm making a statement. You don't want to, you know, set that aside with a note that says, bury me in this. You just got to muss it up. Well, why would I want to be buried in something that fancy? That's just ridiculous. I don't know. Okay, fair enough. Or possibly, like, a random costume. I have a lot of dirndls. <laughs> Maybe I will fling myself from the roof in my nicest dirndl. Tell my son I loved him. <laughs> oh, I found, so the, um, the school that was from that site was... Just like an originally a small, it that okay goes back to the adobe. It was a small adobe building built in 1874. That was the original school, mm-hmm. and then about five six years later, it was replaced with a brick structure, and that was condemned in 1916. But I was right about the adobe. You were right about the adobe. Ah, see, see. Somehow, you were right. <laughs> Um, and then in 1920, it was demolished with plans to build this luxury hotel. So um, now I have a reason to go to Phoenix. I would like to stay at this hotel since it's currently open. You're not going to meet a bellboy or anything that we should be worried about, are you? Um, no, my love tends to be put on my boyfriend. It's not a bellboy or a busboy. <laughs> I've seen him bust tables before, but I don't think that'll do it. See, there's advantages of being the busboy, too. Bellboys may make the money, but busboys get the women. Whatever you say, bud. <laughs> Shall we talk about a drink? Yeah, so what kind of drink did you come up with for us? I love drinky drinks. Um, So these are both old buildings, old parts of town. So I decided to go with a play on something classic. So. I started with the idea of a Tom Collins, which traditionally is one of, it's a very old cocktail. I believe it started showing up in recipe books in the 1870s. Uh, Gin, simple syrup, lemon juice, and seltzer water, essentially club soda. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Collins glasses are actually a type of glassware. They're not super common anymore, but love me some gin. So we started with that. So I decided that I kind of, I wanted to make it a little more feminine than just a normal Collins. And I also wanted to take a little play on, you didn't tell me much about your story, but you told me there was cold temperatures involved and mine had like the first AC. So I, I want, you know, thought of cold. I went with blue. Okay. So what I did is I made a, a tea syrup simple syrup from tea, which gladly share with the world how to do. Um, You're going to make tea, basically steep it as strong as you want, and then you boil that with equal parts sugar until you have a syrup. Very, very easy. Equal part tea and sugar or equal part? Liquid and sugar. So, because a simple syrup is equal parts water. So you're not adding any water, you're just using the tea. I'm just using the tea instead of water. Didn't get the picture. 
I recommend keeping this refrigerated last longer, but um, I used, there's a company called Tea Leaves, and they made a Pantone 2020 Blue Tea. So I used that just because I wanted a little bit bluer, Mm -hmm. but it's essentially a floral herbal tea. Um, The primary tea in it is butterfly pea blossom, so you could definitely use butterfly pea blossom tea, which is super fun for cocktails because it brews purple and when you add acid to it it turns pink so you know this just had some other stuff in it to make it bluer i don't really know what that other stuff is (laughs) might be poison but i drank some and didn't die and then so we did that we did um a normal person would probably want an ounce and a half of gin mine probably had two and a half ounces and then um, I, I squeezed half a lemon into it, or squazed, as I like to say. We squazed half a lemon. Nice squazing. Just squazing is important. You can, you know, use a citrus squazer. It's quick and easy and keeps the seeds out. And then topped it with, uh, I, we, we, I dabbled. I had a friend over. We dabbled in some different things, and we decided it was best suited with a unsweetened grapefruit seltzer water so like grapefruit lacroix or any of those things that taste like someone mentioned a fruit around you <laughs> and then garnished with a grapefruit wheel and it was it was a happy little beverage all right and what were we calling this a uh, rooftop lady rooftop lady sounds good so i think that's going to wrap it up for this um first very very uh poorly put together episode of the booze and spirits podcast uh we'll have the recipe for the rooftop lady as well as some links to some of the stories that we mentioned in our show notes as always we ask that you drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws Uh, don't end up a ghost yourself anything to add kate not when you can Okay. All right. (laughs) Bye, everyone. Say goodbye, Kate. Goodbye, Kate.